Wednesday Night Rugby on Off The Ball. With Vodafone, main sponsor of the Irish rugby team. We all belong to the team of us. Now then, Heineken Champions Cup quarterfinals are upon us. Six Nations has wrapped up for another year. Very happy to say Fiona Hayes, Grand Slam winner, is with us. Hello. Hello, Joe. How are you getting on? Very well. And Jerry Thornley of the Irish Times. Hey, Jerry. How are you doing, Joe? You well? Yeah, great. Might start with a look ahead. This is always one of the great weekends of the rugby year, Jerry. Yeah, it certainly is when there's a couple of Irish sides involved, yeah. So let's start Munster against Toulouse, Aviva Stadium, 3 o'clock. I think, Fiona, they're past the 30,000 mark now for tickets sold. There's talk of buses being put on to ferry people up at very reasonable rates. So it's not Thomond, but they do seem to be doing their best, Munster, to create something of an atmosphere. Uh, yeah, definitely. I, I was even, I bought tickets the other day for a few of us and like you could, they're 20 euro and they're offering buses up for 10 euro return, I think from Limerick. So they, they've really, uh, they've really tried to to bring that home and park atmosphere up to the Viva. I, I know, like um, Jerry, we've talked about this before. I know it's it's very hard to get an atmosphere up in the Viva for some for some reason. Um, but I think um, in the past we haven't seen it. But this could be with thirty, there could be forty thousand. I mean, the weather's supposed to be nice at the weekend as well. You'd be hoping that the that the the Munster fans really understand that there needs to be an even louder roar up there. Hang on, this is a scandal. Fiona Hayes is paying for tickets. Always, always. I can't jump over the, the wall in uh, Balananti in Toman Park anymore. Those days are gone, so I've had to pay for my tickets. Shocking, Jerry, isn't it? Yeah, poor form, <laughs> poor form, poor form. Shows her loyalty, though. <laughs> so set the scene for us then at the Aviva, Jerry, because hopefully it's a very a lively atmosphere and, and, and the players get something to feed off it. And then you have Toulouse rocking up. So we have uh, two teams who have pedigree down the years. We have Munster feeling a touch better about life of late and we have Toulouse who haven't been in exemplary form but they're still Toulouse exactly You've put, that's it you just described it in a nutshell really like what do we they're both in their 19th quarter final which is a joint record held by the two of them and uh, you know Toulouse five time reigning champions as well French champions Munster been at Baron Decade we know since their last title and it's been what 14 years since they last won the Heineken Cup, but they have a home advantage in the quarterfinal. I do think it's slightly diluted by granting Tom and Parr to Ed Sheeran. Um, I think that if you look back at the two quarterfinals when previously when they've met both in Tom and Park and Munster put up 40 and Toulouse both times, and I think it's fair to say in the first occasion a really good Toulouse side were completely spooked by their first ever visit to Tom and Park. And second time round, they were just at a very, very low post Gino Noves ebb. Um, compare that to last year, of course, when Toulouse won in Tom and Park but that might as well have been in a library. So it's better to have a crowd of 30,000, 40,000 in the Aviva than no crowd at all in Tolman Park. It's still going to be more of an advantage than was last year when they lost in the last 16. Compare last 16 meeting 13 months ago to now, and Munster are in a better place, and Toulouse don't seem to be in, in as good a place. Munster only had, uh, that was only their second game after the Six Nations. The first had been a Pro 14 final to Leinster in an empty RDS. <clears throat> This time they've had six games and are on a run of three consecutive wins, big wins against Exeter, and it was a good first leg performance as well. Big win away to Ulster and the flaw, but still a big win at home to Cardiff. So they have momentum. They're playing good rugby. They're making line breaks. Um, Joey Carby alone, he has his mojo back to a different level than would have been the case a year ago when he was still on his way back. I mean, you think of that performance against Exeter in the home leg. That, that goal kicking was truly world class to nail three into that win. I can tell you that for a fact. And then to nail another three in the second half, six out of six, including one from the touchline. He's a world-class goal kicker now. That's one thing that's always stayed solid throughout his career, even when on the road back from injury. But I love the way he took his try. I love the way he marshaled the shape and attack. I thought it was so much better. They're offloading more. Um, they're playing at a higher tempo. Um, and, you know, I think they've got a good chance. Um, you look by comparison with Toulouse, and I think they've lost 10 of their last 15 matches, Joe, which is unheard of form for Toulouse, really. They scraped through against Ulster and Ulster had them. You know what I mean? In both games, they probably had them, but for two very late tries in each leg. I know there'd been a sending off early on, the first one, but, you know, they're not they're not quite firing like they were last year when they arrived. I think they'd won 10 of their previous 12 or 12 of their previous 14, something like that. They were flying high atop the top 14 and on their way to a double. I think there's been a heavy drain on them through France's commitments in November, beating the All Blacks and, you know, being bulk suppliers in the Grand Slam campaign. Um, 
they're heavily reliant on Antoine Dupont and Roman Entomac for moments of inspiration. But then again, <laughs> if you're going to be reliant on those two, perhaps no better two to be reliant upon because as we saw on both legs against um, Ulster, both of them are capable of doing something. In fact, it's impossible to keep both of them in check, particularly Dupont for 80 minutes. It's just not going to happen. Even when he's not at his absolute best, he scores the match-winning try in Ravenhill when he moves to out half. There are very few scrum halves slightly off colour who can move to out half and score the match-winning try in a pressure situation. I even watched the La Rochelle game last weekend and La Rochelle scored a cracking try early on. They were up for it. You know, they have desperately they want to beat Toulouse after the long run of defeats against Toulouse, both finals last year. A couple of minutes later, La Rochelle are in their own 22 and Brice Dulan makes a big bit too much of a wind-up for a clearance kick up the left. And who comes charging through? Only Antoine Dupont charges the ball down and, of course, finishes with about two centimetres to spare before the in-goal area. Um, I think they're unexceptional in midfield to lose. I think they, I think it's going to be a pretty high-scoring game if the weather forecast is true because both teams are scoring tries, both teams have a lot of attacking weapons and both teams can see tries. Um, the one caveat I have to it all is, for me, last year in that last 16 game, a major point of difference was the modern day young athleticism of Toulouse's front row players like Julian Marchand, who's been back the last two weeks and play against Ulster, magnificent over the ball, just a brilliant leader, captain, and Cyril Bay and Aldegheri, and they probably have Faumina off the bench and they have Movac off the bench, jeepers, like, you know, he's a he's a French Grand Slam winner as well, off the bench, and Munster are missing Kilcoyne and since so James Cronin, who were their two loose heads that day. And of course, they're also missing Ty Byrne and they're also missing Gavin Coombs, who just quite a bit of ballast, you know, ball carrying oomph, which you need against Toulouse. So I'm kind of slightly betwixt and between the two. I do think Munster have a better chance than they had a year ago. Um, but then this, as you said, is still Toulouse. Jerry, take it back. That's a hell of an answer. It's a hell, <laughs> the, that's a hell of I an can't, answer. <laughs> I can't follow that, Jerry. <laughs> uh, Fiona, pick up on whatever caught your ear the most because there's, there's so much interesting stuff in that. Yeah, no, he, I just, uh, especially the whole DuPont into Mac moments of magic, I think that's an area, you know, that Munster can't defend against at times. They're going to they're going to have these moments throughout the game. So it, it's what Munster can do in attack it, is a big thing for me. Um, obviously, we know... Gain line is a big thing with this to lose. That's you. You don't want to give Dupont that a ball and a place. So you you want to be stopping the the gain line, the big ball carries with to lose. And and maybe I think in that Exeter game we saw we saw a different kind of monster back row. They really got at that uh, breakdown. And if they can do something similar to the to lose pack, be it they're not going to be able to do for eighty minutes. But if they can slow down that ball and maybe get Dupont worked up a little bit, it's less of a ball and a, and a play for Intermax. So so that's an area I think. Uh, Munster will definitely want to target. And, you know, I think they've changed up their defensive system. Um, we were seen getting caught out wide. I think they were hammering up a lot previous, but in the, after that first kind of Exeter game, maybe after the Leinster game, I think they changed that up a little bit. And we see them more marshalling in defence. They're still coming up. They're coming up quick. So I think that will work a lot better against this Toulouse, but they will have to really work on getting out to the outside because we know that's where they like to attack as well out there. Mm. And is your sense, because Munster had great joy at the breakdown against Exeter, as you mentioned, Fiona, and there doesn't seem to be the same emphasis on breakdown amongst Premiership sides. What's your read on Toulouse when it comes to the breakdown? Can Munster find joy there? Yeah, I think they, I think they definitely can. You're not going to get the same turnovers. I think Munster had nine uh, nine penalties they got at the breakdown. It's not going to be the same. You know, Toulouse are are good. They're clinical in that area, but it's more about kind of judging when to take that bite, when they can go in there. And I think they've been doing that a lot better in recent games. You know, they're 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 taking their chance. They're fanning out in defence, but it's when they pick those moments. I know Tyke Byrne is someone who is missing, and he's really really big at getting the moments right and when to go for that ball or. Mm or when to slow things down. So he will be a big loss. But I think the biggest thing for Munster is that like said, Ken Dillon have now stood up and we're, we're talking about Jack O'Donoghue playing great rugby. Peter O'Mahony had one of his best games in that Exeter game as well. So although there's players missing, I think that Munster have gotten the confidence that we're... we're Front row, I know Jerry is probably an area maybe we don't have the depth on the bench like obviously Toulouse will have. But in general, around the park, I, I think there's guys waiting to come on. I mean, there's the question of Casey Murray. I, I think it will be Murray, but that that's a question that's come on board because of of you know how good how good Casey's playing. And I think Munster's pack and people coming off the bench, it's a lot different than it was in the last time they played Toulouse as well. Mm. And the point on defence is very interesting. So you feel quite late on in the season they've gone to something more akin to a, dr a drift type defence, is it? 
Yeah, kind of. They, they were they were getting caught in the wider channels. I thought Farrell in particular was someone in, in the Leinster game. We really saw it and it was kind of off launch plays in particular because they were they were hammering up and not reading. And in, in Leinster was very obvious because they had so many options available on that ball carrier. And we know what Johnny Sexton can do to put people away. So I thought they changed that up in the Exeter game, especially in the last game. They're still coming up, but it's a slight drift until they get out into the wide channels. And then I feel like they're hammering a bit more. And I think that's helped them a lot and we've seen it in the Ulster game as well it, it, it's shown that they can yeah they can still get up fast off the line but it, it's not trying to cut out that ball and we all love big hits but I think they're reading the game a lot better mm. Van Gran was talking Jerry. I read this in one of your pieces in the Irish Times after the Cardiff game and he was saying one of the things he was happiest with is that whenever Munster conceded they bounced right back with a score of their own mm. and he was saying it's going to be that kind of an affair against Toulouse. He wasn't saying this part, but basically he said, we can't keep these guys out. They're going to score. We're going to have to bounce back and score and not be rattled by it. That said, you look at last year's result, 40 points to 33, an incredibly high scoring game by Munster standards. Munster are going to have to drag that 40 points down to somewhere closer to 25, you would think. Does that point to... Conor Murray and a more structured game and trying to take the sting out of fast track of Eva Stadium, sunshine, crowd really up for it. Like, do Munster don't want to get into a shootout here, do they? No, and he's a better defender than Greg Casey. Um, he's a bigger man. Uh, you think back to that Exeter first leg and uh, so Jackie Andel was just about to ground the ball from an extra mall and Conor came in and, and knocked the ball from his hand. That was as good as the seven points at the other end. You think how finely balanced those two legs were. It was as key a moment as Keith Earls coming across the pitch to make his late tackle late on as well to deny a try. So I think he's a better defender. I think they're a better kicking game. He's also more experienced. Um, he knows Dupont. He knows the French. You know, he, I just think it has a better balance to it when Conor Murray starts. I still think he's a world-class player. Great case, he's no doubt about it. He can add some real dynamism off the bench. You could argue that yeah, if they're chasing the game, you'd want Casey coming off the bench. Whereas if you wanted to close out the game, maybe you'd want Connor. And you just don't know which way you're going to be facing with 20 minutes to go against Toulouse. But I do think um, Johan van Gran is onto something and it is going to have its ebbs and its flows. There are going to be a lot of turnovers. There's going to be, I think it could be relatively high scoring. Both know how to take their three points. Both understand the value of three points. Toulouse showed that in both legs against Ulster. Munster certainly showed a greater appreciation of the importance of three pointers and knockout rugby than Exeter did in both legs. So I think it'll be a fine balance when you take the three and more often than not people will, the teams will take the three. But I do think one area where Munster might be able to hurt Toulouse will be through their line-out mall. And I think they will go to the corner and try and get some joy out of that on occasions in the match. They just have to time those moments correctly. But I do think you'll see Munster go to the corner maybe a bit more than Toulouse and look to get seven points off their mall because it is a weapon. And Toulouse have conceded tries from opposition malls as well. Um, the one area then is the breakdown. And that is, that's an area where they're both excellent. You know what I mean, I think they're number one and number two in the Heineken Cup Champions Cup stats this season. Right. Munster one, Toulouse two. So you will see turnovers. Luke Pierce will be a key figure in the game. I think it's going to be that type of match, Joe. It'll be relatively high scoring, and the ebb and flow, and it'll go. You know, each player, each team will. There'll be a bit of a tit for tat on the scoreboard, and I wouldn't be surprised if it's a one-score game at the end. No, listen, you couldn't ask for more than that. I mean, that'd be just a perfectly acceptable Saturday at the Aviva Stadium. So, Fiona, can I give you like the, the the negative slant or the the question mark you would have over Munster? One, the injuries which Jerry mentioned in the pack. They are considerable and they'll become more considerable as the game goes on and then secondly there is just this nagging sense as to whether we can put much stock in the improved Munster, Munster performances of late Ulster I think you know major hangover after losing in Europe for instance and even the home win against Exeter Simon Zubas is a bit of magic but he's still only touching the ball two times and if, if this is a high scoring game and if Exeter, or sorry, if uh, Toulouse are going to run in four or five, maybe six tries, I just can't see Munster matching that. I just can't see it. I hope I'm wrong, but I that, 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 ultimately, if we were to boil it down to something very basic, I don't see Munster with the ammunition still. 
Yeah, I don't know. I th- I feel like they're they're clicking at times. It, it's not over the eighty minutes. I know Cardiff. They weren't much opposition. The second half, some of the tries scored in in that game were really really good. Their launch plays have gotten a lot better off set piece. I I I I've seen. Um, I know we talked about that extra game and and Zebo didn't get his hands on the ball, but but I thought the partnership of of Farrell and Dialandi, they're doing stuff in the center as well. You know. Um, I think we're just waiting as Munster fans. We've seen it in ebbs and flows. And I think this is a game where where it is high score. And I remember before that 33 40 um, scoreline, people talked about the same about the Munster attack. And there hadn't been much happening, bar pick and goes or, or, or mall tries. And, and they scored a, a few nice tries. Coombs, obviously, a big is a big loss. And Ty Byrne is huge um, and, and definitely kill coin. So it's, it's, it's more, I think, about the players missing. I, I just feel like the guys stepping up this year are a lot far more experienced they've gotten game time you know you have Josh Witcherly he's held his own in Europe there's definitely players I know this two lose front row is a different breed altogether but there's players stepping up into these positions and I'm not worried about the, this starting team I, I, you know with these guys missing I think there's guys ready to come up and take the place and they've had the minutes under their belt as well mm. and did so you one thing, sorry Joe, Jerry yeah please yeah just add one thing to that um, Damien Day and you know he, he's Definitely going to be the best centre on the pitch. He was the best centre on the pitch a year ago. He carved that Toulouse midfield apart in the first half for some bizarre reason that I just don't know the answer to. He hardly touched the ball in the second half. Mm. But they've got to use him plenty. He's a. It's not just that he's a crash ball merchant. Yeah, sure, he can truck it up. But like he's got very good footwork as well. He's got an offloading game, passing game, which they use. And I'm, he's in a crest of a wave at the moment. He. We were talking to him during the week. And I did the stats on it, Joan. In, in his 35 games for Munster, only four have been in front of a home crowd. I saw and that. I, I felt almost sorry for him. The pandemic has yes. really loomed large yes. over his Munster experience, yes. hasn't it? You could imagine when he was asking Razzie Erasmus about going to Munster and maybe Felix Jones, whatever, during the World Cup when he made the decision, oh, you have to go. Tolman Park, there's just no no place like it in the world. And he plays God knows how many matches there and it's just, it might as well be a library. Yeah. And he scored in his last three home games, Joan. You saw the reaction when he got that try against Exeter from Simon Zebo's wonder pass. And I don't think this is an exceptional to lose midfield. Also, they don't have the Cheslin Colby factor anymore. Mm. And I think that Mattis Liddell is not playing as well as he was last season. Thomas Ramos is a class player. But mm. I, I do think, like, Monster do their X factor when you throw in Dayende and Zebo into that mix. And Mike Haley playing some really good rugby at the moment. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I think Damien Dayende could potentially be a match winner on Saturday. OK. You're talking me into it there. I guess we haven't <laughs> seen that Monster best 15 at very often so maybe they do catch fire one other point strikes me Fiona when you're talking about stopping to lose scoring there will be such a temptation to stop the offload and that brings high hits into play yeah, that's a, another area of the game I, I was thinking is that I hope this game isn't decided on a card either. You know, we've seen Toulouse discipline as well isn't hasn't been great, and and we know we know especially those Arnolds they love to get their hands free. They they're really good in the line out, but their their offloading game is really good. And it, it's a quality to lose that they've had all season. They're constantly looking to keep that ball alive, and that in turn brings that higher hits to try and stop that. But I think they've they've been coaching that. I think Munster's discipline around that area has been quite good they're definitely not one of the teams who've been caught with those high tackles so I won't jinx them but hopefully we'll see we'll see a good clean game as well on on Saturday So I know what your heart says what do you think then Fiona? Yeah, I, I, I really believe Munster can win it. I think it, it's going to be a one-score game. I think it's going to be high scoring, as Jerry as Jerry said. But I think the fans are really going to get behind it. I know it's in the Viva, but and people are thinking, oh, Toulouse won't mind going there. But they still have to travel over, you know, and, and you're still coming away from home. Munster are just going up the road. So I really think that will be a, a factor in it as well. And I think a Munster win by maybe four. Okay. Jerry. Well, if five and a half thousand Terran Euro Clontar fans can make more noise than the three Six Nations games at home, then I'm pretty sure 40,000 or so Munster fans can make plenty of noise as well. It doesn't have to be full to be a great atmosphere. Um, and I think it will be a great occasion and the, the crowd will be a factor. Munster are at home here and I do give them a better chance. I just fear that that, that front row dynamism around the pitch as well as the set piece time that Toulouse have it was a big point of difference a year ago and that hasn't gone away so I would, although I would love to see Munster do it, if, if you, if you had, if I had to call it, I would just feel that Toulouse, they've been, they were going to take EPCR to war. Do you remember Jeffy Court in the world when they had that Cardiff game declared uh, twenty-eight nil win for the Blues at, when they were at home, and yeah. they've just been spitting mad ever since. They look like a team on a mission. Yeah. Well, it's going to be well worth the watch. That's for sure. Which game are you going to, Jerry? 
I'm going to Welford Road. Okay, so three o'clock, we'll watch uh, Munster beat Toulouse, according to Fiona. <laughs> and then we have Leicester against Leinster at Welford Road. Top of the URC versus top of the Premiership. Leinster uh, beat Connacht home and away. Leicester beat Claremont home and away. They have George Ford playing great rugby at 10, even if Eddie Jones isn't interested. Ellis Genge in the pack and are very much on the up again. And then Leinster arrive with the perfect build-up, three-week break, the frontliners at home with Stuart and Lancaster with the others out in South Africa and they've been preparing for this you suspect very dig- diligently and perfectly over the last uh, couple of weeks I suppose that the burning question I would have Fiona because I'm not watching the Premiership all the time I saw Connacht a lot of us did run Leicester very close this season how good are Leicester? Yeah, they've been hit and miss this season. I watched their game against Bristol Bears at the weekend. They were, <laughs> now Bristol Bears defence at times has been crazy during, during the Premiership this year. But they they scored 56 points to win 56 26. Um, they're not. They're not the foot. They're not the Leicester I would have seen last year. I don't think they're the same um, kind of powerhouse as I saw last year. They have been quite good. They're sitting top of the Premiership. But I think looking at that kind of game, that's a kind of a clear reflection, I suppose, of the Premiership and compared to the provinces. I think Leinster will win this one well. I do I do think, you know, they've got Jas- Jasper Visa in the pack. They've got Liebenberg. They have a really strong pack their front row gains you're going to see gains hopefully against furlong in in those scrummage and i think furlong will feel like he owes them one or two from from those games but um i really think leinster have had the prep at home they've 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 literally had weeks to study this leicester pack we all know how they play they, they're big on a kicking game they're very tactical you know they've ben yogs and george ford together they play really well but i don't think they change up much that they do it's a similar kind of game they play every week in week out and they do Freddie Stewart is is they have the attack of people out wide and when they get the ball there it's just they're very very clinical but I think Leinster are far more clinical this season and Jerry, we've repeated it ad nauseum I'm sure Leo Cullen and Stuart Lancaster have nightmares about Will Skelton types mm-hmm. uh, running at them in Saracen and La Rochelle jersey so that, that has been the area of concern for Leinster at this stage give or take of the competition over the last number of years are Leicester in that vicinity? Well, there are very few Will Skelton's in the world, for starters. There's actually, there's only one. <laughs> and uh, thankfully, maybe. Um, I think Leinster are better equipped for a, a big juggernaut pack than they uh, than they were last year and previous years through the advent of Dan Sheehan to Josh van der Fleer reinventing himself as a ball carrier. Um, now with Kelleher back, you can start either Sheehan or Kelleher and bring the other off the bench. That's only Toulouse can rival that in the last eight. And you can throw in Andrew Porter and Tyke Furlon as well. Um, yeah, and like, Caelan Doris's form, Jack Conan's form, just and Gibson Park's form, and mm. Johnny Sexton's form, and James Lowe's form. Like Lowe's playing the best rugby of his life. Robbie Henshaw against Connacht looked like a lad who's going to put together another ten brilliant games before this season's yeah. over, yeah. just out of frustration because that was only a six game of the season. So I hope he's got another six knockout matches and maybe three tests in New Zealand, and he can just light it up as he did against Connacht. I think he looks very prime. Like he must be as fresh as a daisy. Um, Gary Ringwell's had a superb season like you just look across the board they're just really well primed for this test I think that being said I would be nervous I see that Blenz were made I think it was five point favourites last time I looked if this was over two legs yeah fine you yeah. would make Leinster five point favourites no doubt but it's a knockout match in Welford Road where Leicester haven't lost in a year they've won 15 out of 15 this year in the proximity of the fans I don't know whether it's an illusion or not it seems to make the pitch just that bit tighter which might suit Leinster that much but then again Leinster won, uh, ran up a cricket score on a tight pitch on the wreck and, you know, won away to Exeter last year at the same stage. And I think they're a better team now. They haven't had a match in a couple of weeks, the front liners, since the Connacht game. And the one slight concern, Joe, it's a bit like Bayern Munich winning the Bundesliga for 10 years in a row. And then when it comes to the Champions League, they're becoming less and less of an impact in recent years, in the last couple of years. Um, because maybe the Bundesliga doesn't prime them as much as it should do for a Champions League. And in that same sense... I think Leinster have averaged 56 points and eight tries in their games in, in the and that's in the Champions Cup this year, never mind the URC. So nothing has quite prepared them for this. But then again, they've been in the UCD camp for two weeks. Apparently they were beasted by Stuart Lancaster. It's Tuesday became Monday and Tuesday and Thursday, I think. <laughs> and um, they'd be well primed. You're right, they know what's coming at them. Admittedly, it's one thing known and there's nothing stopping it. But you know, Leicester play almost no rugby in their own half. They kick 
ad nauseum like Saracens do. They almost try your patience. And Robbie Henshaw was talking about this during the week and the work they had to do up and down the pitch, up and down the pitch for a little bit of kick tennis. So I think they're primed for that. Mm. And I just think Leinster maybe have more weapons in it. I'd be a bit nervous. It could be another one-score game again. Interestingly, Matthew Raynal is the referee. Oh. We all know what happened the last time Ellis Genge and Tyke Furlong went mano a mano at scrum time. Now, my my information is that the information was really laid back to the Irish management that Raynal got at least three of those six mm. penalties wrong against Ireland. And I cannot see Leicester enjoying the same carnage at scrum time that England enjoyed at Twickenham. Now, I know England had a player sent off, but this is still the vast core of the Irish side that while it may not be tested that much in the URC or in the Heineken Champions Cup, was tested Twickenham, was tested in Paris. And I just think they'd be well primed, well prepared for this. And I think it's a good thing that they've had a two-week run into this game. Well, that Reynal point is interesting. That puts another yeah. layer of jeopardy on the whole thing. I do yeah. think Fiona for Leinster must be very difficult. I mean, you know, spoken to a couple of the players at various points, they're fully aware themselves that they have had that 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 spook of seasons going incredibly well and winning games routinely, as Jerry has mentioned there, with fifty plus points per game. And then, in the one game that matters, they play on the back foot for maybe the first time in months, and they don't react as well. Or, or, or systems and things which had been getting the job done suddenly aren't, and they don't have enough practice at playing in adversity. And suddenly, it's a year wait. And I think now we're into a couple of years of these year waits and having to wait a year. And it's a lot of pressure for them, I think more than any other side in Europe, to bring into these knockout games. If you're to lose in any given year, you have the top 14. If you're Leicester, you've got the Premiership or an English side, you've got the Premiership. Leicester seasons really are defined by did they win Europe at the moment? They're just that good. That's a big way to, to carry in to any game, not least if you get off to a bad start or if Matthew Raynal starts pinging the scrums. They, they do carry that with them. Yeah, they, they carry it with them. But I, I think, I feel like this season, you know, they're really focused on winning this this Heineken Cup. It's something they want to fix. There's been a lot of talk that they couldn't deal with the big power packs. You know, we saw it against Saracens. We saw it against La Rochelle. And, and I think Terry's spoken, even the ball carriers with Leinster, I know defensively they've probably worked up, but even I feel like they're attacking the soft shoulders. We're seeing a lot, a different a different type of, of running from Leinster when they're going against these big power power packs they did they, they're focusing on getting to the soft shoulder they're trying to get outside and and they're and they're keeping that ball alive as well it's going to be in the back of their head but they know that they, there's only one way to fix it and it's it's to get over the line and win it and and in watching them I feel like Leinster have been building up for this for a long time they were they they obviously had planned to rest the guys South Africa they've been able to do that because they've done the business in the URC obviously earlier on in the season I mean that's got to be invaluable Stuart Lancaster one of the best coaches in the world and just to have him at home who studied probably every Leicester game there is this mm-hmm. season and just work on little areas they'll know exactly what's coming I, I just think this team, you've got a lot of guys that have played inside that Six Nations as well, and they'll revert back to that when things go wrong. I, I know they haven't had it in the URC where they, they've been down points in, in big games. So I think they they have a place to go. It's from the Six Nations because a lot of these guys play in that and they've and they've played really, really well. So I think they look to that and, and they have great cohesion because of that. And I, I feel like, especially in this game, it's been talked a lot about, mm. but I, I don't think... Think, I don't think Leicester have the have the power in the pack to, to do the damage that that other teams have done to them. Okay, that Six Nations point is a great one. So we're saying Leinster, are we, Fiona? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, I I think Leinster, but I, I think they'll win by a couple of scores. I think they they'll do they'll do the business over there. Okay, comfortable for Leinster, Jerry? Don't know about comfortable, but yeah, if I had to go for one. I definitely go Leinster. I think it'd be a. I fear it might be Leinster to lose semi final in the Avila, and then meanwhile over on the other side, the monster bound. Uh, Mikey Prendergast and wrestling against Ron Nogar and La Rochelle. Yes. Actually, as an aside, you mentioned you watching Toulouse, La Rochelle. The Ugo Mala, Ron Nogara, tete a tete. I briefly saw this and I briefly saw a headline. What happened here? I don't know, to be honest. I just saw myself and they were, they were mouthing something at each other and there was clearly a, clearly a frizz on there. And of course, he's had this run in with Christoph Urias, Urias before. I don't know whether you saw the Urias one, the Bordeaux Begla one, yeah, in the at the side on the full time whistle, but um, suffice to say, uh, <laughs> the words, yeah, off, yeah, fat liner. 
<laughs> we know where that came from. But yeah, he's getting a bit of a reference there, Rog, isn't he? Yeah, okay. Well, I, I, I like the thought of the Bordeaux coach putting that into Google Translate. <laughs> so do I. So do I. It might have been lost in translation a little bit. But yeah. Be- because uh, Mala, the Toulouse coach, after their little exchange, what I did see was he turned back to his Wink. bench, Fiona, and he no. winked at them yeah. as if to say... <laughs> this is what you do to O'Gara now. So like, you know, get a reputation for getting up early and you can sleep in all day. He's now going to face this, I think, a little bit. Definitely. They're trying to wind him up. They've seen that. You you know you could wind him up. We saw Johnny Sexton do it a long time ago as a player and I, I would imagine he's calmed down a lot now as a coach, but they've seen it's happened once and it's brilliant. I love those sideline interactions. I know in France it's there. I, I think it's absolutely brilliant that they're not sitting up in the stands that they're able to get down and, and have the chat and talk to the team. And when you see stuff like this, I think it's great and, and the wink just made it for me. Two last quick points then. Jerry, you reminded me there. Mike Prender gassed. It's been confirmed he is coming in to the uh, much discussed role, one of the more discussed roles in Irish rugby, Munster attack coach. Over to you, Mike. Yeah, well, I mean, is he a, he's nine years now, I think, in the top couture. He's done his time with Oyanax, with uh, Grenoble, with um, Stade Francais and Racing. He would have picked up an, a huge amount of knowledge in that nine years. And he'd already built a good reputation with Jan Munster as a head coach there. Um, I know Mikey. He's a very nice, engaging lad. He's a very smart fellow. He thinks deeply about the game. I would imagine it wasn't the easiest choice in the world because his young family are all very much settled in Paris. But this is the life of a coach. Mm. And I suppose also he's thinking, well, when is he ever going to get offered the chance to co- be attack coach of Munster again? You just don't know, do you? You know, ah, oh, he's a young man. he get the chance again. You never know whether... So he's decided to come home and do the job. It'll be... He'll definitely have more focus on him. You know what I mean? Munster expect a lot. You know, they've got a big history and they haven't won in 10 years. It's not, you know, it's, it's not Liverpool. It's more Man United. You know what I mean? It's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a bigger job. Um, and there'd be more scrutiny on him at home from his own supporters than, you know, he would be from Irish people working abroad. So, it, but I do think he's, uh, I hear nothing but good things about him as a coach. Um, like that bank of knowledge he would have, generated in the last nine years working with all the wonderfully gifted players that he's worked with in the top cators I think he's a he's a superb appointment I think the obvious one I'm glad he got it Okay uh, Last point then Wednesday Night Rugby here with Fiona Hayes and Jerry Thornley brought to you by Vodafone proudly supporting the Irish women's rugby team we all belong to the team of us just by the way to give you an insight into Fiona Hayes Jerry. so we were <laughs> in Virgin doing the England-France match and the weather was beyond miserable and was set to be miserable for the rest of the evening. Fiona was going up to Belfast for the game. She announced to myself and Jenny Murphy she had no coat and <laughs> she said, I'll be grand, to which we said, it's really not a good idea. Like, <laughs> Jenny Murphy was like in her car scavenging for a spare coat. Fiona was like, no, I'll be fine. I'll be fine. At one stage, Jerry comes out with just a woolly, a Jenny with a, a woolly hat and holds it up to her and Fiona's already started the car. So... I don't know, have you thought out, you complete mad woman? <laughs> I, I was actually, as you say in Limerick, I was grand. There wasn't a bother in me, Joe. I had a couple of points, lovely and warm. The jacket was still on at three o'clock in the morning in the club in Belfast and I was rocking it. The jacket was green, so I was supporting Ireland. That's why. Very good. So, it was um, miserable, Joe. It yeah. was miserable up there. It was well, freezing, though. Uh, the last day of April. May Day the next day, you wouldn't have gone. Well, look, according to Hayes, anyone with more than two layers on was just, you know, soft. So this was Wooden Spoon dodged in the end. Enya Breen, take a bow, last minute try, last minute kick as well. Ireland win 15 points to 14. So they kind of pluck this whole championship out of the fire. To be fair to them, uh, Fiona, you can you know you talk about the, the pros and cons of the performance. What it definitely spoke to was for all the talk about the team and everything going on around the team, mm. There is a, a real spirit there. They kept going and it was like incredibly admirable way to finish the championship. And like they celebrated like it was the penalty shootout, you know, when they sprint down to and you bring and like we could look at, back on that result as a very important one for the team because can you imagine, can you imagine wooden spoon and just heads down and oh, where do we go from here? 
Yeah, it was what they needed. Um, you know, I didn't question the heart or character throughout the, you know, I thought it was very good in the first half against England. They were just overpowered then and there, there's nothing you could do with that. But in this Scottish game, I just thought they really, really need to score. I mean, myself and Jerry were talking there a minute ago about game management. There was like 81 minutes left and, and they were going wide to score. And we were like, no, no, it needs to be in front of the post. We need a kick. And look, and, and they came back and, and I thought they, the clean outs, they were playing they were playing like their life depended on it they really wanted to win and Enya's footwork got over the line so I just I think it's 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 the start of this team they've now got to build on that but it's it's great as someone from the outside to have a look in and see that that character to see that that heart was there it, if you revert back to the qualifiers they would have lost those games for some reason they didn't seem to have that spark but they've got that now they have a chance and a summer tour ahead especially for them to bond and start building building on these partnerships and hopefully this 7s, 15s stuff will be resolved as well by the time the next six nations rolls around. Jerry, even you who had to furiously rewrite your article last minute must have been uh, <laughs> buoyed by the finish. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't the only one. <laughs> There's a few of us in that boat. Um, yeah, um, yeah, it was, uh, it didn't look like it was going to happen. It just didn't look like it was going to happen, particularly um, like they responded really well to going to try down the first time. I thought they controlled a lot of the first half, even though their kicking game wasn't good. They got some joy out of it. Um, but they went on with a poor kicking game, and Scotland's kicking game was much better. And then Scott, and then the discipline went. I think they conceded nine second half penalties. And just, this match just seemed to be inexorably slipping away from them, and it was just oh no, a wooden spoon on top of going out in Parma to this Scottish team. They're now going to be. I think it would have only been Scotland's second win in something like sixteen meetings with Ireland. Yeah. Um, so. To, to to put it out of the bag and such a grandstand finish left a far a, in a weird way I was speaking to Greg Williams afterwards it was it might actually be more beneficial than a commanding 40-10 win mm. because they will get so much out of this they, they've they been to the well and they know they can go there again and that's going to be a, a major boost I'm sure they need performance levels improving I'm sure they need you know, underage structures behind them, underage team behind them, and sure they need more game time, and they need uh, not just a question of just giving them professional contracts. I don't think that's going to solve it, and they definitely need to resolve the fifteen sevens issue because that's just crazy. I think, in fairness to the RFU, it's I can't understand how World Rugby allow a sevens international sevens tournament I know. to be on the same weekend as a finale to the Six Nations, mm. but I don't understand the rationale in sending away full time players to a tournament that's just streamed online away from a tournament that like had 150,000, I think in Virgin Joe for one of the home games and 650,000 on BBC audience thing an Ireland game. Like I don't know if David Newsom for quite gets the fact that in Ireland we're very much 15. We're, we're you know, like this sevens is great crack, but like we're a 15 country. And that's it, the way but isn't the bottom line that sport Ireland give a grant? It's an Olympic sport. Yes. These are all the incentives. Yeah. But I mean, look, sponsorship money is not going to sevens in this country versus no. 15s. No. So, and like I said, yeah. audience figures alone, this is this is shop window stuff. This is like, you know, Ireland v England, the Six Nations, Ireland v whoever in the Six Nations yeah. on terrestrial television as against a, street, a, a sevens tournament in Canada. Well done to the girls finishing third. Great effort. But I think um, I think England finished ninth. You know, there's no, no doubt where their priorities are. Yeah. Uh, last one. And Fiona, because I feel we've talked about all this uh, so much over the last couple of weeks. It feels almost uh, like an unfair question because, as Jerry said, what they're doing in sevens is great. But I just think the average fan in the country would think, well, let's just let's let's get really good at fifteens first, and then we'll go after sevens, as opposed to doing it in the way that we're doing it. Almost like let's just embrace our fifteens DNA culture here. And the RFU, uh, I mean, they're not doing that for various reasons we've mentioned. But you just can't compare a Six Nations shop window with sevens and, and, and this policy shows no sign of abating I don't know anyone who likes the policy no, and, and you know what? Some of these girls haven't even really played 15, so they don't even understand it. So, you know, they, they went, they got third, and they're absolutely delighted. And I was delighted to, for them to get because I know the training that's gone in and the hard work that's gone in. But as a nation and as a fans, this country loves the Six Nations. We love the game of 15s. Um, you might switch over and watch the sevens. I might tune in online, but it, it, the heart is in the 15s game. I know it comes down to money and all that, but they're really going to have to decide, I think, going forward. It's either one or the other or else 
get together with World Rugby and change the times of these tournaments, change the dates, because nobody wants to be following, like, you know, I talk to people who, who just tuned into the women's game and are talking about Eve Higgins and this and asking me why she wasn't playing in the England game. And it's it's very hard to explain to that person on the outside what's going on. So so I think it, it it's... We love the 15s games. The sevens girls might argue, look, you know, this is where we want to play and that's all well and good. But we just need to get the national team, the 15s game up and running and then we can see what we can do from there. Uh, thank you to you both. Enjoy the Viva Stadium. Enjoy Welford Road. Jerry Thornley of the Irish Times. Fiona Hayes, Irish Grand Slam winner. Thanks so much, guys. Thanks, Joe. Have a good one. Hey, Fiona. Wednesday Night Rugby on Off The Ball with Vodafone main sponsor of the Irish rugby team we all belong to the team of us